Chief Dan Stewart of the Wilmington Fire Department. I'd like to welcome you to our training session today of dispatch procedures and functions. Whether you're a new dispatcher or a dispatcher just viewing this tape for a refresher, this is a vital task and a vital component of your job. Some of the topics that we will be discussing today will be the fire alarm system, the radio systems that we have in place, the Z-Tron, standard operating guidelines both in dispatch and for the fire department, and the fire prevention office of the Wilmington Fire Department and the functions that it performs. You are a vital link in the public safety chain in the town of Wilmington. It is critical that you as public di safety dispatchers are proficient in these functions. We have with us several individuals today that are going to discuss some of the items that I outlined a moment ago. The first person that will be speaking to you will be Dispatch Supervisor Stacy Scott. Stacy will be giving you an overview of the procedures in dispatch and many of the functions of the console and how to use them. Hi, my name is Stacy. I'm going to be going over our radio frequencies today, um, the main frequency, the mutual aid frequencies, uh, the admin channels, and things like that. Um, this is our Zetron screen. We have uh, all of our fire department channels are to the left in these four boxes here. The top box is the primary channel, which is highlighted yellow right now. That means it's our main channel, um, which we can speak on using the left button on the mouse. And you just press that and you can speak over the fire radios. Or when it's highlighted yellow, you can also come over here and hit the transmit button, which will also allow you to talk over the fire channels. Um, if you click, you can also click on the blue to select that channel as well. If you have it on the blue, then you can change the volume over here on this with the yellow buttons. You can just up the volume or lower the volume. Um, the second one down here is our mutual aid channel, um, which if you select it blue, you can come over here to the frequency buttons and you can up the frequency or lower the frequency to right now we're on Burlington. Um, we can go to North Reading, Tewksbury, Reading. We can cycle through many of the local towns. Um, we can listen to them. We can talk to them over the radios as well. Um, the third one down here is another mutual aid channel. And this is how we speak to Chelmsford Control, for instance, or uh, Bill Ricca Fire. Um, so, which can be useful sometimes. Um, the bottom one down here is another channel where we can talk to our public works buildings. That's what we have it on right now. Um, we've gotten a few medical calls through them when they have actually uh, had a worker injured on the job and they can just contact us directly through the radio. Um, we can also change the admin channel, which one of our lieutenants uses during the day. Um, to, he goes around and works on the fire alarm. So we can speak to him that way. Um, you can also, when they're selected with the blue, you can also mute a channel. Uh, so if you're getting any feedback, you can mute the channel for the time being. Um, the other thing you can also do, which is nice, is you can hit a group select button, which is the green button over here. And if you just hit the group select, it highlights all of these in yellow. And we can then make an announcement over all three channels, the police channel, the fire channel, and also the vocal alarm, which goes throughout the building. That way, we can get a call out to everyone simultaneously. Um, we use that once in a while. Um, the other thing over here, when something's highlighted in blue, if you hit the instant transmit button, you can transmit over anything that's highlighted in blue. And these can be changed back and forth from the police side to the fire side. So you can talk on either channel through the radio here. Um, down here at the bottom, we have all of these green buttons which control the fire doors, the apparatus bay doors, as well as some of the police department's doors. 
um, as well as a stairway door and a hallway door. If we go beyond that to once we had our phone system go down and to deal with that, what you need to do when that happens, our main frequency goes down. So you have to come over here on the bottom, you have four disable buttons on the bottom. A main disable, an AGFA disable, an industrial way disable, and a local disable. You have to click, left click on each of those disable buttons, which disables those sites. And you click the main standby button, and you can now speak on the what is we normally consider our primary block over there. Um, but you only want to do that in cases where we are unable to use the phone lines to transmit. Um, we also have the radio up here, which has contains some of the same channels as the Zetron screen. You can just click over on here on the left one. The let's see. The admin channel, like I was saying, we were speaking to the lieutenant during the day who works on the fire alarm. You can also speak to him using this radio. Um, we also have Wilmington Direct, which the firefighters use to talk directly to themselves when they're on the scene, for instance. So again, if all of our, um, if we're having trouble, difficulty talking to the firefighters, we can use the direct line and sometimes get through to them that way. Um, and that's mainly what we use this radio for, is to speak um, to the firefighters or to the lieutenant that's doing the fire alarm. That is the mostly just a general idea of how the fire radios work um, and how to deal with a situation when the phone lines go down and you need to disable the sites and, and speak to the fire apparatus and the firefighters in a different way. I'm going to be going over uh, the difference between a master box, a Keltron alarm, and also what an open circuit is. First of all, a master box alarm is basically an alarm that comes in over this panel here that lets us know that there may be a fire happening somewhere in town. There are a bunch of different circuits. We have circuits one through six that are actually connected to lines in town, and they depict different areas of town. For instance, circuit number six uh, covers all of Ballardvale Street. So if we get this flashing, and our circuit, this yellow circuit button lines up, we know that it's for circuit number six, and it's somewhere in that section of town. Also, simultaneously, while this starts to flash, we'll get something that pops up on this screen here, um, which tells us the master box number, because all master boxes have actual numbers attached to them. It'll give us an address that the master box is located at, and also hopefully a company name most of the time so we can dispatch that easily to the appropriate address and company name. Um, we also at the same time as that is occurring receive a printout on on these sheets here. Uh, this gives us the same information that comes up on this screen. Uh, a master box will come in four times, so we get four separate printouts on this with the same information. And a master box always prints out in red, so we know that um, it's actually a fire alarm that we're receiving. Um, we also, at the same time, some companies have what's called a Keltron system that comes over the phone line. Um, this lets us know as well, again, that there's possible fire trouble. It gives us a little more information. It'll give us a location in the building, perhaps, or um, that a smoke detector uh, has gone off um, in, a, in a lobby or something to that effect. So we can update them after we've dispatched them to uh, let them know the exact location in the building or what exactly set off the master box alarm. Also, sometimes we will also receive just the Keltron alarm. Um, that also prints up on these printouts, but it prints up, uh, for the most part, in black, unless it's called a fire alarm, and that will print up in red. Um, for the most part, we do not dispatch on just a Keltron alarm. They have contact n names and phone numbers, and we'll, for the most part, try and contact someone at the business um, to find out if anyone's working on the system or if there is actually a problem there. Uh, we then notify the lieutenants. Then he may 
take a swing by the building just to be sure that everything's all set. Um, lastly, um, we really need to, actually, third to last, we really need to make sure that we're paying attention to the printouts on the machine. Sometimes when we receive the master box and the Caltron at the same time, they overlap each other and it can be a little confusing as to which is which. So it's a good idea to look at your printout um, and to decipher whether receiving just a master box or a master box with a Caltron. Um, last thing I'm going to talk about is an open circuit. Occasionally, um, we'll ha this will start flashing, um, not quite like a master box alarm comes in. It's a little bit of a different sequence, and we'll have a circuit light up um, with a loud buzzing noise. It means a circuit is open. Um, to silence that, we will press the ground buttons. My name is Sullivan. I'm at 707 Wooded Street, and I'm uh, just shooting out of my house. Okay, Sullivan, why don't you exit the house, and if you can, just stay away from the house, okay? We'll be there as shortly as possible. Okay, I'll okay. Call you Thank you. Okay. The following is just a test. A report of a fire, flame shooting out the window, 707 Woburn Street, the Sullivan residence. Okay. A report of a fire, 707 Woburn Street, the Sullivan residence. Ladder one, you're on 1453. Engine four is on 707, Wilburn Street. Engine four, you're on 1453. Warming to fire announcing a still alarm. Squad one, ladder one, engine four, responding to 707 Wilburn Street for a possible fire at 1453. Fire alarm to engine four. Engine four. Engine four, you have hydrant located at the corner of Lowell and Woburn, also at Avco's driveway. That's one of Fire alarm answering squad one. We're on the scene, nothing showing. We'll be investigating. Fire alarm is squad one on scene, nothing showing. Investigating 1454. Fire alarm is ladder one on scene, 1454. Fire alarm is engine four, off the hydrant, the difference between a master box and Keltron and we had a 911 call thrown in there for a house fire, for a possible house fire. Um, and that's how we would dispatch a house fire. Thank you, Stacy. Our next guest is firefighter Tom Sears. Tom served for several years 
as a dispatcher in Wilmington, as the dispatch supervisor, and most recently as a firefighter in town. He can see many of the things that you're experiencing in your job from both perspectives. Tom is going to talk today about task orienting, which is basically securing resources as they're needed and as they're requested on scene, and how to get these resources. He'll also mention a little bit about the incident command system, which is a basic management structure which reduces span of control, which is how many people are being managed by each supervisor, and categorizes the tasks, such as emergency medical, operations, and uh, public information distribution of information. Many of the resources that you will be required to secure range from notifying individual firefighters or officers to respond to a scene, individual units, group callbacks, department callbacks, mutual aid communities, or specialized units, such as the hazardous materials unit, a decontamination unit, the incident support unit, critical incident stress management personnel that may be needed, our own confined space rescue team here in the Wilmington Fire Department, a dive team, a fire investigation unit from the state fire marshal's office, a bomb squad, the Mass Emergency Management Agency for a multitude of uh, resources. And it is critical that you know how to get a hold of these units or resources and how to communicate with them. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about task orienting and the importance of such uh, during an incident with the fire department. Um, as you will find out in the fire department when something, um, the fire department responds to an incident, it can go from very uh, as we like to say, routine to something escalating uh, out of control in a, in a hurry. Uh, your job as a dispatcher would be to supply and find the resources for the incident commander on scene and get them to his uh, uh, site as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible also. Uh, one of the things to uh, remember when you are doing this is that uh, to prioritize uh, in order of importance uh, what resources you're going to have to find and send and that is uh, one of the things I'll uh, discuss and explain in a little bit more detail. One of the examples I use uh, for an incident would be a house fire. Normally when the fire department responds from here it's going to be two engines and a ladder um, and that is typically our first alarm assignment. If the chief or deputy happens to be working and we are getting calls for the house fire, they would also respond. That's still considered our first alarm response. Once the incident commander arrives on scene, whether it be the chief, the deputy, or the lieutenant for that day, he can make the determination of if he needs more resources to declare what he calls a working fire. Well, the definition of a working fire is one of three things. Either one, he no longer has the resources on scene to handle a situation, whether it be manpower or water supply. Number two, he has arrived on scene shorthanded. Uh, one truck could be on another call and has uh, pulled up on scene just with the engine and the ladder. And number three, the need to call a working fire would be for station coverage. If he sees that the resources he has on scene could cover the incident, but that they'll be tied up on scene for a while, uh, declaring a working fire would bring coverage to the station from out of town and from within the department from off-duty firefighters. Once on scene and the incident commander declares a working fire, within the next couple of minutes it's going to be chaotic in here in, in dispatch. You're going to be um, asking, asked of a lot of demands and a lot of tasks and they're going to be calling for a lot of resources. Again, this is all contingent on the size of the fire, type of the fire, location, and whatever resources he already has on scene. As I had mentioned before, a typical response is for two engines and a ladder to the fire. And once the incident commander declares a working fire, you would then fill out a working fire assignment of one engine to the scene with one engine to the station for coverage. At that time, if that 
is enough resources for the lieutenant or for the incident commander, as the case may be, you would then be responsible for calling in off-duty personnel. One of the things to remember that at a house fire, or any fire for that matter, it's important to get the resources to the scene as quickly as possible. So in order of importance, number one, what you would want to do is make sure that the lieutenant or the incident commander receives that engine, or if they special call another unit, whether it be a ladder or a rescue truck, he gets what he needs to the scene first. Secondly, in order of priority, would be to get station coverage. During an incident, it's important to make sure that the town still has its coverage that it needs and that the resources here in town are available should the need arise in the event of another call. After you've made your calls to neighboring towns or according to the running cards, as, as we do here, and you have your, your engine or your covering piece here at the station, you would then go ahead and notify via a pager system all off-duty personnel to respond to the station to help fill out for coverage. That's a typical re response during the day. That would change, however, at nighttime where off-duty firefighters are typically home and some of us who work at night may not be available. At night or any time that we have a working fire, after we send out a page to the off-duty firefighters, at night you want to also call by phone the fire chief and the deputy so that they are made aware of the situation and they can either make the determination to either respond to the scene or they'll ma maintain contact with the incident commander from the scene through their radios. Another incident that doesn't happen too often but when it does could create um, some stress in here is in the event of a med flight. And what we use med flight for is typically as a airborne ambulance to transport victims from the incident to a hospital uh, either long distance away or due to traffic uh, constraints through Boston uh, into Boston or the appropriate medical facility. Since med flight is just an air ambulance, and that's really all it is, um, it's not, do not pay too much attention to the fact that um, what's going on may sound, sound chaotic on, on the radio, but in actuality it's just another ambulance that just rides by air. Um, sometimes what happens is people tend to get tunnel vision or they get excited when they hear that, oh my god, we need med flight, when really it's just another resource that we're bringing into the scene to help supplement what's going on with, with the scene. Um, one of the things to remember, however, is that you need to get information from the incident commander to provide to MedFlight uh, in the event of that uh, situation. Some of the questions you're going to want to ask the incident commander are, number one, what type of victim do you have? Do you have a, a medical emergency or do you have a traumatic emergency with the victim? Uh, typically, the gender of the victim and the approximate weight of the victim. Um, I know this sounds kind of a lot of questions to be asking an incident commander, but MedFlight's going to ask you these questions on the phone. So if you have these answers already ready for them, it's going to save you some time and cut down the radio transmissions. Once you've determined, or the incident commander has determined that you, uh, he needs a MedFlight, he or she needs a MedFlight, uh, it would also be your responsibility and to help the incident commander to find a landing zone and through cooperation with the police department, secure a landing zone for the fire department. Typically, if there is a, a med flight situation, the incident commander is going to be tied up either one with other resources coming in or number two, possibly with the rescue and extrication of said patients. Once you've determined med flight is, is coming into to Wilmington, you're going to want to switch from our main fire frequency to our, our secondary frequency, which is channel five. MedFlight has the ability to speak with us on that uh, frequency and what will also happen is the incident commander will switch to Channel 5 to speak with MedFlight directly to give them updates of the patient, location, and when he wants the helicopter to land. Once the helicopter is in the area, it's the incident commander's determination when the helicopter will land. The helicopter should not land until the incident commander determines that the area is safe for that to do so. Just as in a working fire, you're going to need to get certain resources uh, into town and into the, possibly into the station during a med flight incident. If 
the situation is occurring out on the highway or another uh, far part of town, the incident commander may determine it necessary to get station coverage into the town. It's your responsibility as a dispatcher to know what section of town it is and which appropriate running card you should go to to get that station coverage, whether it be an engine or manpower to the station from off-duty personnel, or in some cases, even extra ambulances to the scene. When you are, again, task-orienting uh, a situation like this, it doesn't uh, change too much from during a working fire situation. You still need to get the resources to the scene for the incident commander as quickly, as efficiently as possible, but you also need to make sure that you have appropriate coverage back in, in here in town to make sure that the town can still continue its proper protection. Uh, the importance of you as a dispatcher to maintain control of your situation back here and to understand that you back here have a job just as important as the responders out there. There's nothing that you can do back here that's going to make the situation out there any better if you become excited back here and lose control of the situation back here. Your job is to supply the resources to the fire department as quickly as efficiently as possible. You're responsible to make sure that you understand the locations in town, the running card assignments, as will be explained to you later on by your supervisor, how to read the running card assignment should there be a vacancy in the running cards, how to fill them out, and to understand that once the resources have been given to the incident commander, the incident is not necessarily over, and that you need to also maintain proper communication with the incident commander and orient yourself with the responsibilities that go on with the incident. So in short, learn your responsibilities and your response areas in town. Learn the different running cards that are appropriate for the areas in town. Become familiar with the resources, the different resources that the fire department has, whether it be a dive team, med flight, a hazmat team, um, different radio communication control areas, <clears throat> whether it be Chelmsford control, uh, Metro fire, uh, different mutual aid towns, their frequencies. Learn the resources, become familiar with them, and be comfortable with your job and your tasks at hand so that when the incident does arise, you can smoothly and efficiently perform your job. Our next guest is Steve Staffier from Allcom Communications. Steve's company specializes in radio communications and installations for fire departments and other public safety organizations. Steve is going to discuss the radio system here in Wilmington and how it operates. He'll describe to you the primary system which consists of a primary receiver as well as satellite receivers at various points in town particularly the Nassau Ave water tank, the Progress Way cell tower, and the Agfa Corporation rooftop unit on Ballardville Street. All of these antennas are distributed throughout town to provide for the best reception. When a radio is keyed up in the field, the signal registers at a particular tower that I had just mentioned. Through a series of telephone lines, that signal is sent to a comparator, which evaluates the strength of the signal to ensure that the strongest signal reaches you here at dispatch. Steve will also, also discuss uh, various procedures such as direct communication with, without using the repeater. He'll also discuss our backup procedures and how to activate and disable our primary radio system and go on to our backup radio system with the antenna here at the base tower at the public safety building. You would need to do that in the event that the main system went down, for example, if the radio, if the telephones went out. Steve will also discuss a little bit about the Z-Tron and also our mutual aid radios and a little bit about different bands, such as VHF, which our primary uh, radio is on, the very high frequency, or ultra-high, or UHF, which is, makes up the primary uh, mutual aid frequencies. Welcome, Steve. 
I'm here to show you how a fire dispatcher dispatches equipment from the Wilmington Public Safety Building. Pieces of equipment are made from Zetron Company, in which you have an audio panel, which a dispatcher can transmit and receive messages. The top panel is a Model 26 fire dispatcher panel, in which dispatches the apparatus in the station. It'll send a significant tone to signify the type of call and which apparatus to respond. It coincides with the computer in which the dispatcher has a display of different channels and functions that they can use. At this time, we'll dispatch engine two on a medical aid call. And if the dispatcher was to press the engine two button under the headquarters column, right now in the firehouse, they get a significant tone. They know which company needs to respond. The tone you just heard signified a medical aid call in which the ambulance had to be dispatched. Once the firefighters board the equipment, they need to acknowledge on the acknowledgement button, which is a red mushroom button next to the Zetron alerting system on the apparatus floor. Once the light is green, the dispatcher can move his mouse over to the vocal arm module and transmit his message. Once the message is given, the apparatus acknowledges on a piece of equipment on the apparatus floor that they are on the way to the run. And the status would show flashing red on the engine two column. Once the fire truck calls off at the scene, the dispatcher can move over to a module, which is the fire department pr primary radio, in which they can talk to the fire apparatus. This computer is mouse driven, as you can see, the icon moving around to each module. Once the fire truck clears the call and returns, they can status themselves back in quarters in the fire station, and the light will go out. On the computer screen, the dispatcher has several modules, the first one being the fire department primary, which controls their radio system, which we'll explain in the second segment. Second module, they have the ability to control mutual aid radio, third module is a second mutual aid radio. Fourth module is a backup radio for the fire department, which includes some of the town agencies. All three modules are able to select frequencies. For example, on the fire department's auxiliary DPW module, it actually controls a VHF radio in the back room, in which we will show you in a second segment. And by using your frequency select up and down, they'll change the display of what channel you want to talk on. For example, I've changed it to FG, which is a fire ground frequency. Once the dispatcher is done, they can recall to the original frequency, which it stays on public works. The vocal arm module that's in the middle is what I showed you earlier, is which they dispatch over an in-house PA system to alert the firefighters of a call. Last column is the modules that represent the police radios in case they had to dispatch police units from this position and which include the police main radio, police mutual aid tactical channels, and a backup police radio. Below on the screen are icons that display the sites the fire departments have on their radio system. They have a four-site VHF voting system. The main transmitter is at the Nassau water tank. They have a satellite receiver at the AGFA building, a second receiver in industrial way, a third receiver and backup transmitter here in the public safety building. In the event the main transmitter fails, the dispatcher may select a standby transmitter. By selecting the main standby icon, it changes to display to standby, and now they'll transmit from this building. and we'll select them back on fire primary. This radio console has the capability of patching and simul selecting or simulcasting. If a major catastrophe was to happen in Wilmington and they wanted to patch fire department and police communications, they would select the patch button, patch the fire primary module with police and now both departments are patched. In order to disable the patch, they would reverse the procedure. And as you can see, this is fully mouse driven. 
The second function I talked about was simulcasting. If the fire dispatcher wants to give a message over the in-house vocal alarm as well as the fire radio system, they would select simul select, select the fire module as well as the vocal alarm module. And as you see, both have a green highlight bar. When the dispatcher transmits, it'll go over both. And you can reverse the process to disable the simulcast. There are two other radios in the console that are for backup, mutual aid, and inter interoperability purposes. One is a UHF Motorola Astro radio, which is fully programmed with surrounding police and fire departments as well as mutual aid channels. And the second is a VHF Motorola Astro radio, programmed with town agencies as well as surrounding departments. Both radios are completely independent of the radio console system in the event of a failure. In the second segment, we'll show you the backroom electronics, which includes the actual radio equipment as well as the electronic brains of the Zetron console. Here in our second segment, we're going to show the backroom electronics of the radio equipment and console. The first piece of equipment from Zetron is the common control unit. The cards on the left represent the channels. Each card represents two channels that appear on the console that may be police or fire, maybe the in-house PA system or a mutual aid radio. The middle cards are the auxiliary input and output cards which control the door controls or even the voting display for the sites on the fire department radio system which we'll show you in a minute. The last series of cards are the console interface cards which represent the number of consoles in the dispatch room and as you see there are three cards. The next piece of equipment below is the Motorola comparator which is probably the most important piece of equipment in a radio system. The comparator consists of four receiver cards on the left side which represent the radio sites in the fire radio system. First card is the 9X tower, second card the AGFA building, third card industrial way, and fourth card here is the standby local receiver transmitter. On the right side of the unit a tone priority module, a command module, a tone keying module, and the power supply. This particular device performs two functions. The first function is anytime a portable or mobile radio in the fire department radio system keys up the system, it acknowledges on the card with a yellow unsquelched light and then votes with a green light. By voting, the site has chosen the best audio and signal to pass the system. And that's the site in which will be routed through the system. On the right side, Anytime the dispatcher keys up the console, it keys up the tone priority card and modules and allows him to talk through the system. This comparator also mixes both audio from the street as well as console audio so that both units could talk at the same time if need be. In the last segment of equipment in this room would be the four pieces of radio equipment that are remotely controlled from the dispatch center. The top radio is a UHF Motorola Astro Spectra in which the dispatcher can remotely change frequencies to operate in the UHF band. The second radio is a VHF Motorola Astro Spectra that the dispatcher can also remotely change frequencies from the dispatch center. The third radio is a Motorola MTR 2000 which is the backup standby transmitter as well as the local receiver on the fire department's radio system which we explained earlier. In addition is a duplexer which allows two frequencies to pass through one antenna. And the last piece of equipment is a Motorola MaxTrack low band radio in which the dispatcher can remotely select two frequencies to talk on the mutual aid system as well as two surrounding towns. At this time this concludes our segment of communications for the Wilmington Public Safety Dispatch Center training. And here is a typical setup of mobile radios in a fire truck in Wilmington. First radio, being a Motorola MCS 2000, is their main radio on the VHF system. By selecting rotary knob, you can change channels to other departments they may need to respond to. 
By pressing the home button, they return to their main system. Radio is identified on the microphone of fire radio. Second radio, similar type, is a UHF radio, which they can communicate with the police department and surrounding towns. You can change the channel by rotating the knob as well. By pressing the home button, they can return to the police channel. Microphone is labeled police to identify this radio. 18 Longview Road, 26 F Pass. We're returning. Once the firefighters arrive on scene and they have a fire, the driver of the apparatus would be the pump operator. He needs to communicate with the rest of the firefighters. He would do that by utilizing the pump panel microphone and speakers as well as volume controls. As you can see, there's one for the UHF mutual aid radio and one for the main VHF radio. To summarize today's communication training at Wilmington Fire, we first visited the dispatch center and showed how the dispatcher dispatches apparatus and operates the radio equipment. Secondly, we showed the backroom electronics of where the radio equipment as well as the electronic equipment that run the dispatch computers are located. We explained how the radio system operates. We showed you on the apparatus floor how the firefighters acknowledge their runs. You've heard the tones that go off to wake the firefighters and alert them of a call. Lastly, we showed you a piece of fire apparatus, typical mobile radios, as well as the pump panel microphones and how they operate the radio equipment at the scene. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was great. Our next speaker is Lieutenant Ed Cochran, a longtime member of the Wilmington Fire Department and our fire alarm superintendent. Today, Lieutenant Cochran is going to talk to you about the fire alarm systems as they come into this building and basically the two types of systems that we have here in Wilmington. The primary system is the municipal loop which receives alarms over our own municipal circuits, which we have six of them, that consist, uh, are connected via telephone pole to the various locations in town. That's the red fire alarm box that sends a telegraph signal, four digit usually number to you here at the uh, Caltron in the console. Our other system that Lieutenant Cochran will describe is a digital communicator system that also comes through the Caltron and is far more precise and far more broad in the amount and types of alarms that it can send to you. He'll talk to you about how those systems work and a little bit of troubleshooting, for example, through the meter, how to evaluate amperage and voltage that could assist him in the event of an emergency. If the fire alarm develops a problem, Lieutenant Cochran or Firefighter David Filer would be the people that you would notify in order to help you get, uh, get that system back up and online. I'm the fire alarm superintendent and I'm going to be talking to you about the Form 4 and the Caltron, which are the two basic pieces of equipment that run the municipal fire alarm system. This section over here is the Form 4 with all the uh, pretty uh, buttons on it. This is um, the six fire alarm circuits that go throughout the town that are connected to all the master boxes. The last circuit, circuit nine, is the house circuit and that's what makes the whistle blow for no school or nine o'clock in the morning or nine o'clock at night. The, um, these two pieces are the internal office equipment for the fire alarm system. Out in the street, it's connected to 25 miles of wire and all the red fire alarm boxes that you see on all the schools, on all the businesses, hanging on telephone poles. Uh, every one of these circuits um, is a, an individual pair of wires that run out, uh, go down the street, go somewhere connected to all the boxes and back here. The, the system runs on a hundred uh, milliamps and whatever voltage it takes to get that hundred milliamps out through 
the um, number of feet of wire on that circuit. To keep the 100, you can see it's a little high. There's around 100 milliamps. But it takes 13.9 volts to complete that circuit, circuit one, which is uh, Main Street uh, to Eames Street. Um, and uh, Jewel Drive, and any fire alarm box on that circuit um, connects to this piece of wire. Then you go two, one, three, and five run north to Main Street, to um, Main Street, and go south, north, Industrial Way. Two, four, and six run to North Wilmington, and uh, six is the biggest circuit. It runs eight miles out to uh, Ballabale Street. So being the biggest circuit, you can see it takes 26, 26 volts to run it. If um, when somebody uh, pulls a box, um, all of a sudden the number's going to start to flash in here. It'll come up on the screen over here. All these lights start to blink. We can um, simulate that in a, in a few minutes. Um, and it'll print up on this screen on the, the Keltron. It'll give you the, the number of the box, and it'll give you the address and the name of the company. And there's other pertinent information that we can, uh, we can add to the screens. Um, hydrant locations, um, there could be a flag on here for hazardous materials at the, the uh, location. Um, if something should happen to the screen and it didn't work, we have a, um, a book up here. They can just look up the, um, all of the, uh, the numbers are right here for the boxes. There's about 215 uh, fire alarm boxes that are out on this uh, system. Uh, what I'd like to do is simulate uh, a problem that could arise uh, with the system. We could have, you could be sitting here minding your own business and all of a sudden something happens on the street and a wire breaks and it's going to open a circuit. You can see, you can see here that circuit one opened up. Uh, the reason the other lights are lit is because when the, it repeat, it'll repeat through all the circuits. Um, but circuit one is open, we can tell by, by this light right here. Uh, that means that there's either something that has caused it uh, low voltage, or, and that's the low voltage light that's just come on, or that a wire has broken. Um, the printer just printed to let us know uh, circuit one. Um, we received what's called one stray blow on circuit one. You can see that over here it says open one. <clears throat> now to get the, um, the, the circuit to, um, now, now what, all right, now what, what has happened here is the circuit is, there's a feature built into this machine where the circuit has gone into automatic ground. All, if a wire is to break on, on the circuit, it doesn't matter. Each, all of a sudden, each side becomes its own separate circuit and works through earth ground. And after um, however long that took, about uh, 20, 25 seconds, it went into automatic ground. So uh, the system will still work even though one side of the wire is broken. We can still receive the master boxes. It's uh, basically a telegraph system. It just um, it telegraphs in numbers that correspond to locations here. And it's, it's, it was built back in the 1800s. Somebody designed this thing, and it just, it works. It's uh, tried and true. And there's, um, it's simple, and it uh, gets the job done. So now um, we go out uh, and fix the wire. We find the wire. It's a broken wire. We call back into um, dispatch, and we want them to uh, reset the circuit. We've fixed it. So they have to reset it. They come over here, they push this. Um, the circuit closes, the light goes out, we know the circuit's fine. The, the buzzing is to let us know that, that the um, auto ground and the, the, those two buttons were pushed in. Everything's back to normal. You just go about your, your business um, uh, in dispatch, whether you're dispatcher for the police, the fire, whatever. Uh, and then we just clear this on the screen over here. The Keltron, which is this piece of equipment right here, is capable of two functions. It'll receive the box alarms 
from the municipal fire alarm system and it'll receive central station alarms. The Wilmington Fire De Department runs their own central station. And this is a phone dialer that people mount in a fire alarm panel uh, at the company. And when the fire alarm trips, it dials up a number that comes into here and the information will print on the screen. Uh, it can be backed up by a master box and that would come in at the, the same time. These would blink, this thing would print, and we would get the alarm for, uh, and one, it's, they're redundant, but one backs up the other. If the telephone lines are down, the fire alarm lines are gonna probably be still working or, or vice versa. We can, um, we can show you now uh, what it's like for a master box to come in. You'd be sitting here, and all of a sudden, uh, somebody will pull a pull station, a smoke detector will trip, or there'll actually be a fire in the building, it'll trip a sprinkler uh, system, and that will trip the master box. And you'll see what happens here in, in a minute when um, the box starts to ring. And we're going to pull the box out front, which is the public safety building. It's box 4111, and it'll um, come in here and start to print. And you'll also notice it'll come right up on the screen, the location of the box. You can see, you can count the clicks. One, two, three, four. The first number, one, one, one. The number's 411. It's already printed right here. Up top, box four on circuit two, box 411. Public safety building, one Adlake Street. So what the dispatcher would do after they've confirmed four rounds of this box, they would tone out, press uh, one of the tone buttons here, would send the tone off upstairs. They would come over the intercom. Uh, receiving master box 411, 1 Adelaide Street. Um, squad 1, ladder 1, and engine 2 responding. Uh, after the box comes in, you can see that the, the circuit, it wants to be acknowledged. So you just press the yellow button, you clear the circuit, and then I can come over here, it tells me that I have three alarms waiting. The, f the first alarm is the one that printed. The three alarms waiting, so it came in four rounds. Every box prints uh, four rounds. They don't all necessarily have four numbers in the code. Some of them have three numbers or two numbers, uh, but it'll, you'll always get four rounds of the box. If you don't, or if you get more than four rounds, there's something uh, the matter with the box, and we can go out and fix that in no time. And now everything's back to normal, or as normal as it can be in here. So uh, just to go over what I said, the um, two big brains of the whole place, uh, the Form 4, the Keltron, uh, everything's going to come through one unit or the other, sometimes both. Uh, the information will print right in front of you, uh, numbers, it'll print out. On a hard copy here, it'll print out on the screen. Gives you locations. Um, it can even be as sophisticated as to give you individual devices, uh, smoke de detectors, uh, pull stations, um, uh, sprinkler flow valve. So um, I think we should go out in the, uh, in the low voltage room now, and I'll show you how the circuits actually uh, get in here. We're in the low voltage room now. This room is uh, comprised of the phone system for the public safety building. This is where 911 comes in. All the lines come in from the street for 911. Uh, cable TV comes in and the municipal fire alarm system. This is um, the section that we're standing in front. This is uh, Dave Filer. He's the assistant fire alarm superintendent. Uh, David and myself take care of all the, the wires and the fire alarm boxes uh, that are out in the street and throughout town. Um, so you people will be seeing us in dispatch constantly. Um, this section from here to the corner behind David is all the, the fire alarm system. It comes in in these uh, wires that come up through these pipes that run out into the street, into the cabinet that's uh, um, across the street. Um, it's a 50 pair, uh, 25 pair, I'm sorry, 25 pair wire. Uh, one comes in from the street, which is this wire here. And this other wire goes out and goes into dispatch. 
Uh, one big problem that any fire alarm system has, you can talk to anybody in any of the neighboring towns, thunderstorms, lightning, erroneous electrical hits from car accidents and um, uh, um, high voltage wire falling down on top of our wire. So uh, we're, we're pretty, um, we're constantly um, working with fuses and lightning arrestors and different things to keep the uh, high voltage off the uh, low voltage uh, system. The, this wire here, this comes in from the street and you can see the pairs are all color coded. It's all nice and pretty. Well, if you can look, there's a white and a blue pair here. This comes in from the street. Then there's a white and a blue pair here. This goes out and runs in the dispatch. So when you go into the back of the Form 4 in the Keltron, you're going to find these white and blue wire and this goes along to Circuit 1, which we talked about earlier, that runs down to um, South Main Street and Eames Street. Uh, the other end of this, the white and the blue, runs out into the cabinet and it'll follow along in that color code and that pair wherever it goes in town. We have uh, circuit 6, which is over here, which is a red and a, and a blue, and you get on the end of Belleville Street, um, down by the North Intermediate School, and you're going to find a red and a blue wire, and the red and the blue wire are circuit 6, and that's all that will ever be on the red and the blue is circuit 6. So that's how we keep it straight in the multi-pair cable with the, uh, with the wires. Some of the other wire runs down into smaller two-conductor uh, red C. If you uh, notice around town, a lot of the telephone poles have the uh, two-conductor red wire. Sometimes you see the covering hanging down it falls off because the older wire wasn't UV protected uh, like the, the, um, the newer wire is and um, the, the uh, covering gets eaten up on it and it falls off. It doesn't mean the integrity of the wire is breached, but um, it's just it doesn't look very nice hanging down. So um, it all comes in here into dispatch. The rest of this, uh, this is a battery charger. We have batteries down here. If uh, we lose power, uh, this will support the uh, fire alarm system for... Um, Fred Ryan, call 206. Fred Ryan, 206. This will support the system for 24 hours. Um, we do have emergency generator, but you still have to have it. If something happened, the generator didn't start, we, we still have to... Uh, we provide the service of the fire alarm to the uh, businesses and, and municipal buildings, so we have to um, have the battery backup. Uh, the rest of this is just, these are uh, amplifiers for chimes and speakers and different things that around the station that um, have to do with the Keltron and, and dispatch. So that's about it for the low voltage room. Uh, we'll go outside to the master box now. Our next speakers are from Action Ambulance. And Action Ambulance makes up the ALS or Advanced Life Support component of the emergency medical system here in Wilmington. Wilmington firefighters are EMTs or BLS. Action provides paramedics or ALS. Our guests today, Rich Raymond and Mark Miller, will describe to you the procedures needed in order to activate the ALS, the information that they will need, directions to a call, cross streets, assistance with finding locations, and precise and accurate medical information to help them evaluate the call and prepare for treatment once they arrive. I'm Rich Raymond, and I'm the clinical coordinator for Action Ambulance, and I'm here today to talk about some dispatch criteria which would help us um, get a better understanding to the call we get to prior to arrival. Um, some of the criteria we look for would be the uh, age of the patient, the sex of the patient, and the chief complaint from the patient. Um, with that, 
We also like to see some medical history and uh, meds and any allergies to medicines. And that's just going to help out um, exponentially when it comes to get arrival on scene and we'll grab in which bags. Um, for information also going to the call itself, we look for some uh, major streets that the street might run off of, any cross streets, and most importantly, if there's a split in the street where we have to gain access from a different route altogether, that would make our dispatch times uh, much, much improved. Um, but we're going to talk about two different um, types of criteria today, the medical patient and the trauma patient. So we'll start off with medical. The medical patient that we uh, would like to see criteria for us to be dispatched to would be allergic reactions and um, on, a, on, on when dispatching to that, what is the reaction we're looking for if it's environmental or if it's medical, um, if it's a medicine versus a food allergen or such. If you can let the crews know that prior to arrival, that'll help them out uh, quite a bit. Also with medical, we're looking at cardiacs. Uh, there, most people call up and say, you know, I'm having chest pain. If uh, we can hold them on the phone a little bit longer and find out what type of chest pain, what brought the chest pain on, were they at rest, were they exercising, were they shoveling. Um, if it's a male, if it's a female, that helps out quite a bit as well. Um, also, if they have a history of chest pain and did they take any nitroglycerin or any aspirin. Um, the next up would be respiratory. Uh, respiratory is another big um, call that we see an awful lot and what would help the crews coming would be um, if they're in um, respiratory arrest and also what, um, what's their history of respiratory. Um, and with the respiratory there's another big factor called the sh um, choking. And is the person currently choking and has the obstruction been cleared? If we can get that prior to arrival, that would help out uh, also considerably. And we have some more medical patients, and that's um, a change of mental status. Uh, again, that breaks down to two different categories. When you talk about change of mental status, you're talking about a stroke versus maybe an uh, insulin-dependent diabetic who's having a hypoglycemic event. Um, so if we can keep those people on the phone and figure that out um, with the change of mental status, when did it start, how long has it been going on, and does the patient have a history of maybe a stroke in the past or um, any diabetic reactions in the past, does the patient take any medicines to help that, um, that would help us uh, bring in the right medicines versus the hypoglycemic event versus the stroke patient and what transport and what facility to transport to as well. Um, another medical patient we talk about is the overdose. Um, that comes in a couple different uh, arenas as well. Did they overdose on um, a medicine that we know of or that we don't know of? Um, so if it's a medicine and you can tell the paramedics prior to arrival, we can start looking in our files to see if it's something we know about. If we don't know about it, we'll probably ask the dispatcher to call poison control. If you So you can keep your poison control number handy when you see a, a poisoning. Um, and let's see. With the poison also, we need to know what is the name of the poison and maybe how much or thereabouts how much they took prior to arrival. So if we do have the opportunity to look it up before we get there, that'll help out quite a bit. Um, environmental emergencies are very big um, during the cold weather or in the heat uh, and especially with the fire departments going into homes to fight fires and such, they might drop. So we need to know hyper or hypothermia patients. Um, what's the climate that they're going into? Is it a firefighter in a burning building or is it just um, a person running and got a little hot and fell. Um, we need to know how long they were in the exposure for. If they were found in a snowbank and they were there for a couple of days, that's really important to know. And um, the exposure itself, um, is it a snowbank or is it a cold weather from um, being found in a lake of some sort? So we need to know s along that line. Another medical problem would be the OBGYN patient. Um, um, when we look at these, we need to know if the patient is uh, first time pregnancy and if it is, uh, how long in the contractions, if we can get that over the phone line. If there's any um, known injuries that's going to result of this, if they know they're coming up to a bad pregnancy where they need a C-section and such. And um, are there any other complications we should know about? Have they had past medical histories on their second child that in the past they've had some um, issues in the past? So if we can find out any information with that, is there any um, bleeding? or is the hypertension there at all? So those are very important questions to ask when you're dispatching for OBGYN patients. Um, and then uncontrolled bleeding. Um, a lot of times we get dispatched to the person with a laceration, um, which is fine, uh, but I think to better the resources, if we can figure out where the blood bleeding is from and how much blood is being let. 
Um, and we talk about, you know, a simple laceration to the hand uh, versus a massive laceration self-induced to the throat. Um, those are two different things. Um, obviously, the little laceration to the hand, we don't need ALS, but anything major with a blood loss greater than um, yeah, um, uh, maybe a good sized puddle. When, when you talk about a good sized puddle, you're talking about 500 cc's of fluid or so. So something like that we need to know. Um, that would help us out quite a bit. And then, uh, let's see, unconscious, unresponsive patients. Uh, those are very good to know. Um, when we talk about that, when was the person last seen? And uh, what can we get an update always when we um, when the fight department beats us there or the police department beats us there, whomever it may be, if they could just give us a quick update that, you know, the person was unresponsive but is now responsive and the patient has a patent airway or doesn't have a patent airway, it just helps us again bring in the right um, gear that we need to make the scene quicker and safer. Um, and then uh, a lot of times people will call and say, someone's sick and I don't know why. That's called the unknown medical. And I think, and what we look for is to send the paramedics to always, always send them to the unknown medical because an unknown medical could be a gunshot, could be a childbirth, it could be a cardiac. So, uh, but the only thing we ask for the dispatches is on the unknown medicals, if we can get an update from the police or fire, whoever's first on scene. So that's the um, really important on the unknown medicals. If they can update us to let us know what the complaint is would help out considerably. And um, I think I pretty much covered the medical end of it. So we're going to break into a little bit of trauma. Um, this is um, the criteria that we follow and it's pretty much followed from the Department of Public Health as well. As well. So um, some of the big traumas we see are falls and you know some trip and falls off the of stairs are probably not there for paramedics to respond to but when you're looking at falls greater than 10 feet with a, um, with a positive loss of consciousness, if there's any unconsciousness at all in the episode, if there's any bleeding, where is the bleeding from, and is the patent airway, is the airway patent, or have they lost their airway? So um, that would help the paramedics know, again, what gear to bring in and what to look for when we get in there. Um, another big one is burns. Um, you know, you talk about burns, a sunburn versus a radiological burn versus a um, true house fire burn. So what is, the, what is the process of the burn? What brought the burn, burn upon? How much of the body surface is covered? Is this the face? Is it the toes versus is it the chest? Um, if we have any burns to the airway, we need the paramedics to respond. Um, and, and with the burn also, um, what we need to know is how long has the burning been going on? Has it been a house fire that they've been involved in for the last hour or just a quick onset of smoke inhalation? That's always good to know for us as well. Um, then we get into electrocutions. Um, paramedics should respond to all electrocutions just because of the conduction through the heart. It could throw a, a, an arrhythmia through the heart. 10, 15, 20 minutes down the line that would per cause the person to go into a V-fib arrest. So electrocutions are big for paramedics to do an EKG on. Um, explosions of any sort, uh, we look for that. For the kinetic energy, we just don't want, um, when we talk about explosions, um, whatever, a gas line or something might force so much trauma internally on the heart lungs and kidneys that we need to do an assessment and rule out if we should transport to a level one trauma or a basic hospital as well. Um, so explosions, you definitely want to get an evaluation from paramedics as well. Um, gunshots and stabbings, um, paramedics should respond to all of those. For um, questions asked over the phone though is uh, if we can get it out of them early, what size gun or blade was it used and um, is the scene safe? For actually all traumas we want to know about if, is if the scene safe. Um, where is the stabbing of the gunshot? and is there a lot of blood loss and how's the airway and consciousness of the patient as well. And then motor vehicles, there's a million motor vehicles every day so um, what we look for is the type of intersection, is it a busy intersection or is it rural, the speed, um, was it a highway rollover, was it an auto pedestrian, was it a child on a bicycle or a motorcycle. Um, what we need to do is most likely we send paramedics for any highway accident, any type of rollover, auto pedestrian and motorcycle, pediatric, paramedics should respond to all those. If it's a simple low speed MVA on a main street, it's um, something that the, uh, you could probably rule out upon the uh, first agency to arrive, they could probably call and cancel. So that's what we're looking for if we can get an update as well. And then MCIs, any mass casualty incident, we definitely want to have the paramedics there to work with the police and fire and get the incident cleaned up and ready to go. 
But um, that's what we look for at Action Ambulance for a dispatch criteria. So the criteria we just spoke of are uh, both medical and trauma assessments that we need taken over the phone. And these assessments are going to help better utilize the resource of uh, the paramedics arriving on scene with the appropriate equipment and allow them to treat the patients a little bit quicker and maybe get transport to the hospital a little bit quicker as well um, and an end result of better patient care. So the assistance in this is going to really affect patient care outcome and uh, I appreciate your help today. We will give you a brief tour of the dispatch center at action that you may be interacting with directly uh, from your dispatch center here at the Public Safety Building. Action Ambulance is located on Woburn Street in Wilmington. This is Michael Waronker. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Action Ambulance Service. And we're here at Action's Communication Center today to kind of go through the processes and the procedures in terms of how we dispatch our units for calls for assistance within the town of Wilmington. We have a communication center that's staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which utilizes uh, the latest and greatest in information technology to put the uh, closest resource on call in the shortest amount of uh, time required. Um, over, um, we have multiple dispatch stations and call taking stations, and what we do is we take calls. They come in usually via um, telephone from the Wilmington Fire Police Dispatch Center. And what happens is we receive the information from them and then we dispatch our resources. Simultaneously what happens is while we take the information for the call, we enter it into our computer-aided dispatch system and that system will pinpoint the location on a call uh, with our mapping system so we can tell the uh, closest cross streets. That information um, is then, after entered in the system, we're able to ultimately track uh, system performance and run sophisticated uh, performance data for the system. After the call is entered in the system, and uh, while it's being entered in the system, the paramedic units that are responding to calls are simultaneously dispatched through our uh, computer-based uh, two-way radio system. Typically what happens is the information is relayed to the crews in the field. The crews will then, um, after they receive the information from our communication center, will get on to uh, a frequency that is um, identical to Wilmington Fire's frequency, and they let the fire department know that we're on and responding, and then they confirm and verify the address of response with the fire department. And they typically will tell the location that they're coming from so the firefighters can pre-plan uh, if necessary to meet the uh, crews en route to the hospital. So that's um, just a brief synopsis of what happens. Um, it, the way that our system is set up is that um, our dispatches have um, a computer system that is dual screen and then also a two-way radio system which is all soft touch control. Um, the CAD system, a computer dispatch system, has mapping and it has um, key different uh, color-coded uh, functions for what particular units are doing at that point in time. What also happens is that the CAD system is integrated electronically via the internet and through uh, global positioning systems and automatic vehicle location systems where it will rank the closest truck to the call based upon the mapping information that we get for each address. And then we're able to literally track the ambulance as it responds to the call. And if we want, we can look at the speed of the ambulance, how fast it's traveling, and where, it, where it's traveling to and from. Um, so what will happen is the um, paramedics will arrive on scene, they pass that information on to our dispatches, and then when they're right, signed in route to the hospital and arrive at the hospital, we'll also let our communications people know that, so we can now track um, data relative to response time, at scene time, and uh, total uh, call time and patient contact time. Uh, in terms of our communication center, the way that's set up, we have um, it's um, secured. We have video monitoring to be able to monitor who is accessing and who's not access, who's able to access the communication center. And we also have um, a large map that's projected on the wall so that anybody could walk in at any point in time and see what the vehicles within the fleet are doing. Um, we have high-speed internet access. We have alphanumeric paging capability to page information out to trucks so that we can confirm addresses via electronic means. The communication center has taken an actual emergency right now for the town of Wilmington. Uh, the call taker just completed getting the information from the 911 center, at the combined police and fire 911 center in Wilmington. And we're waiting for the information. It's now in the computer system. It's 251 Middlesex Avenue. And now you can hear that we're toning out the ambulance through our radio system for the location of the call. Paramedic 65. 
in Wilmington, 251 Middlesex Ave. 251 Middlesex Ave in Wilmington, respiratory distress, medic 65. And you're responding now. The map on the wall is representing uh, a little bit of Woburn, and the white is representing the bulk of, um, of Wilmington. If you look at the blue flag and almost in the center of the map with the little ambulance, that's the location that we are, our operation center and communication center is located on Woburn Street. If you go up and move um, to the top of the map and over to the left, you'll notice there's a pinpoint, which is the public safety communication center or 911 center for the town of Wilmington. So that gives you a geographical representation of um, the physical layout of where vehicles are responding from for the town. To recap a little bit of what you've seen, um, a typical 911 call in the uh, town of Wilmington will originate with the caller and will come into Wilmington's emergency communication center. If that particular call happens to be de determined to need advanced life support resources or additional ambulance resources, then the town can call over to Action Ambulance Service, and we will use our emergency communication center to notify our particular fleet you know, and our paramedic units that happen to be responding. And we'll utilize our mapping system, uh, our um, other information technology strengths to be able to put the closest resource on scene in the quickest amount of time. We've also been able to see a little bit of the geographical differences between the communication center for um, the town of Wilmington and also for Action Ambulance Service. Geographically, they're not far apart, and it helps to create one coordinated uh, emergency response system to serve the needs of the residents of the town of Wilmington. Our next guest today is Lieutenant Dan Hurley. He's the fire prevention officer for the town of Wilmington. He'll be describing to you many of the functions that he does here in the fire department. He inspects buildings for fire safety and code compliance. He reviews plans for new construction, construction, again for code compliance, things like sprinkler systems and fire alarm systems. And he's also responsible for issuing permits, which we are required under Mass General Law, it's 148 and uh, 10A and the CMRs, 527 CMRs which require the fire department to issue permits for safety in the areas of propane storage, flammable liquid storage, underground fuel tanks, um, school inspections, uh, fire uh, alarm and fire sprinkler systems, blasting, fireworks, and on and on. Because we issue so many permits, there are many people that interact with the fire department that come in in person or via phone and that's where you come in as the vital link to ensure that those people make contact with Lieutenant Hurley so that they can take care of the business that they intended to. It's also critical that you evaluate a call. If someone calls in and says, boy I'd like to uh, disconnect the fire alarm system or I'm going to be working on the sprinklers at a certain address, you have to make sure that um, the lieutenant is aware that the, the work is being done and that a permit has been issued. Hello, my name is Lieutenant Hurley, and we're going to do a training tape for the dispatches, uh, things that you should know about the fire side. Number one is there's a white book downstairs at dispatch. It's enable, disable. That is for permits for fire alarms for the buildings in town. If someone is going to be working on the fire alarm control panel, there's a permit posted at the panel at the facility, and then the other half is posted in this book at dispatch. It lists the company name, the location, the master box, and qualified personnel that should be the only ones going in to work on that panel. For example, I have Frito-Lay right here, 337 Ballardville Street. There's four names on there. If somebody calls up from that facility and their name is not on the permit list, you should not give them authorization to work on that panel. They will probably complain and you should actually shift that up to the shift lieutenant and let him handle it. If he is not in uh, the building, it would either be myself or Deputy Bradbury. 
so that you should not have to worry about dealing with the, that individual, shift the responsibility upstairs and let the fire department personnel handle it. There's another book at dispatch. It's a contact book. This one right here is A through L, and the other one would be M through Z. That has all the information in there when I go out and do an inspection on the building. In front of me again, I have 375 Ballardville Street, which is Frito-Lay. Actually, 337 Ballardville Street, excuse me. They have a phone number, a fax number, emergency contacts, so after hours, if there's an emergency in the building, example, uh, a sprinkler activation, we want to notify somebody. There are names there with home phone numbers and cell phone numbers to be reached. Also on this page is hydrants, where the master box is located on the building, if there's a master box, the Knox box that has keys in it, where the panel is located, the fire department sprinkler connection, the sprinkler riser, if there's a fire pump in the building, where the gas meter is, where the furnace, electrical room, domestic water shut off, if there's an elevator, if there's propane, if there's any hazards at the site. So all this information can be gotten from this notebook. So if we do have a run, you should make a habit of opening up the notebook, have it in front of you on the desk, that way all this information is right there. There are also many other permits that uh, are given through the fire department. There's a propane permit, an oil burner permit, an underground oil tank permit, fire alarm permits, sprinkler permits. None of that really has any uh, jurisdiction with the dispatcher. If you did a, do get a call on that, you should just channel that upstairs to the fire department, whether it be myself, the deputy, the chief, and if neither one of us are in the building, it would be the uh, line lieutenant, but they would not deal with that. They would probably just take the information and pass it on to us. One other item that we have is called the file of life. That would be for uh, a medical aid call. This would be found on the refrigerator in the house and it has the person's name, all the information about their medical history, contacts, family members, doctors. A lot of times I will have on the 911 screen, this will be red flagged, saying that there's a file of life at that location. So if you do see that on the screen, this is what it is, and you should notify A2 and the ambulance crew that there is a file of life at that location. That way they can look at the refrigerator and get the information. That's the end of the presentation from fire prevention as far as permits, what you should do in the contact book at dispatch and how to use it. Hello, we're in the sprinkler riser room at the Wilmington Public Safety Building. This sprinkler system is similar to many of the uh, sprinkler systems throughout our community. This right here is where the water comes out of the street up through the floor that will supply water to the sprinkler system throughout the building. Up here, we have an OSNY shutoff that the firefighters would use to shut down the water to the building in case we had to shut down the sprinklers after it put the fire out. Next is a backflow preventer. This prevents water from the sprinkler system seeping back through the pipes going into the domestic water with which we would be drinking. So this is a backflow preventer. Next in line would be another OSNY shutoff valve that the fire department would use to shut down the sprinkler flow. And last but not least, this is the alarm valve. There is actually a clapper in here that would open up and shut down. That stops the water from going out. If there's an alarm, it would let the water go up through the pipes, through the building, and eventually out a sprinkler head. That's a brief explanation on a sprinkler system. There are many sprinkler systems that you really don't know ha have to know about at dispatch. But that gives a brief overview of what a sprinkler system is, just so you know about it when we are responding on a call. And our final guest today is Lieutenant Joe McMahon. 
Joe is a shift supervisor in the fire department. We have four shifts. We have four shift supervisors. The lieutenant runs the shift, oversees the day-to-day -day operations, day-to-day uh, -day functions of the Wilmington Fire Department, make sure that the uh, station is in order, make sure that the uh, equipment is in order to respond, and oversees initial response to all types of alarms. Today, Joe is going to discuss a lot of the procedures that are necessary to ensure a smooth response. He's also going to um, discuss some of the duties of the um, shift supervisor and um, some of the terminology that is peculiar to the fire department only. We use terms phrases, expressions that you will hear nowhere else but the fire service. And that's why it's critical that you uh, understand these terms. And several ways to become proficient in that are to uh, listen to the scanner radios that you have downstairs, plug in the uh, other towns, listen to their day-to-day -day functions, monitor them, and you'll become much more familiar with how other departments and how the Wilmington Fire Department operates. And probably the final point as far as the shift lieutenants are concerned is since you will interact with them probably more than any members of the fire department, that if you have a question on anything, be it a response, be it a question dealing with the public, anything at all, if you're not sure, ask. Call them on the radio, call them on the phone, call them on the intercom, but ask the lieutenant. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Lieutenant Joe McMahon for the final segment of our training video today. What I've been asked to speak about uh, on this segment of the film is pretty much how to uh, talk on the radios, how to interact on the fire side only. Uh, whether it be on the PA system, using the Z-Tron, or radio procedures. Um, the first section that I'd like to talk about uh, would be radios. The categories that I'm going to go over, uh, I'll explain them in depth after I go through the, uh, the categories. The first one is channel 1 being on a repeater, as, as opposed to channel 5 being on a repeater. Uh, what is direct, as far as our radios are concerned? How the portables work with and without a repeater? What happens to the portables in some buildings in what we call dead spaces? What's a PL? Uh, making sure you know the frequency numbers. Listen to other radios so you know what's going on in the other towns around you. Uh, how to handle an open mic. Um, and repeating what you hear on the radio. The first category, as I said before, a repeater. Channel one is on a repeater. What that means is when we key the mic, it has to go to a remote area. The transmission hits that remote area and then comes back to the station. The same thing happens with dispatch. When you transmit on the radio, it hits the remote receiver and then hits the portable radio or the truck radio that you're trying to reach. As opposed to channel 5, which does not have a repeater. It's direct. So the reception will not be as strong on channel 5 as it will be on channel 1. When you talk on channel 5, it goes right from the station to the truck or the portable, as opposed to getting the signal boosted from the repeater. The second thing which you may hear us talk about is when we get on a scene is to go on direct. What direct is, is a setting on our radios that takes the repeater out of the system, which means we talk from truck to truck. Um, and most of the time, you will not be able to hear us talk back and forth. The reason we do that is when we go into buildings or we get into dead spaces. Um, to show you an example of, of what would happen is two firefighters can be standing side by side. And if they're in a dead spot or they can't hit the repeater, they will not even be able to talk to each other. So by going to direct, it takes the repeater out of the system and allows us to talk back and forth. If we get in a building, um, there are numerous buildings in town, one being the basement of the health center or x-ray that has lead line walls that the transmission cannot get out and hit the repeater. 
So we switched to direct, and we're able to talk back and forth to each other, and we will relay messages from the portables to the truck back to you. All it is is a different setting on our radios. Um, a PL, what a PL does is it splits the frequency even more. There may be multiple people on our frequency, but if we put PL, which stands for private line, on our frequency, it just splits the frequency even more, so you cannot hear the other towns. It just blocks them out, and all you will hear will be the apparatus from this town. If you disable the other PL, you'll get whatever other towns may be on our frequency. Also, what you need to know is what you get a book when you first um, start working is frequency numbers. You need to know what the frequency numbers of all of the fire department channels are. Uh, for the simple reason, uh, other apparatus may be calling for the frequency. Med flight that we use may want the frequency as is, as they will with the PL line. Um, just make yourself familiar with the frequencies as well as what the private line numbers are. Um, listen to the other radios on the other towns. When you're working, uh, if you're in the watch room and there's not too much going on, Turn the radio on scan so you can listen to the other towns. You get a lot of information as far as if their ambulances are out, uh, if they have a fire, what's going on, if they're going to call us. Not only that, you, you, you can pretty much learn how to talk on the radio by what they say. It makes you understand things and makes things a lot more clearer. Um, open microphones. What an open microphone is, is somebody may have it on their coat and be keying the button and not know it. Uh, the microphone may have slipped in the truck and the button is open. They may not know it. If you get an open mic, you cannot tell them the mic is open because they can't hear anything when that mic is open. The best way to handle that would be on the police frequency, see if you can get whatever truck you think it is on the police frequency and tell them they have an open mic. That's the only way you can get that unit. If it's engine two, the mic is open, you will not be able to talk to engine two on that frequency or on that radio. You'll have to go to the other radio, which is the police frequency. If, if at all you don't fully understand the message, make sure you have the apparatus out there repeat the message. Always acknowledge that you've received the message and always make sure the apparatus that you tell acknowledges the message just to make sure you're on the right page. That way, nothing gets lost in the translation from dispatch to trucks and from trucks to dispatch. Um, and repeat the message exactly as you were told, because it can be a huge difference between one word, especially on a hazmat incident. Don't be afraid if you have to ask the officer or whomever to repeat the message more than once. It's imperative that you get the right message as it is that we get the right message. That's why we have you repeat it. The next section that I'd like to go into is briefly phone calls. Uh, for instance, not delaying the phone call if three people are listening to the 911 phones. Not delaying dispatch to send the police first. Making the announcement when one dispatcher, when the one dispatcher may be on the phone and another dispatcher can make the announcement. And how the announcement should be made. Do not delay dispatching the apparatus if multiple people are in dispatch. If there's three people in dispatch and you're listening to 911, one person get the gist of what's being said, put the phone down, and announce it. It's not necessary for everybody to be on the phone and wait for everybody to be off the phone to announce the run. You can hang up. If further information becomes available, you can tell the apparatus once they radio on the air. Do not delay dispatching ambulance or fire apparatus to send other vehicles first, for instance, the police. There's two dispatches. If it's a medical aid, do not delay sending the ambulance to dispatch the police first. It can be done in simulcast. You have two dispatches. You can do it at the same time, but make sure there is no delay between dispatching the apparatus and other units. Uh, making the announcements. Announcements, regardless of what they are, are always done twice. Whether it's an emergency run, whether it's a telephone call, whether you're paging somebody to the front lobby, everything is done twice. Because the acoustics in the apparatus room are not conducive to us hearing a lot. It echoes a lot, so if you announce it twice, chances are we can pick it up the second time. When you tone out a run on the Z-Tron, 
the way it's toned out is after you tone it, say what type of incident it is. First thing out of your mouth should be medical aid, kitchen fire, house fire, wires down on that type of thing. So the first thing you say it's type of incident, the address, the name of the people, especially on a medical aid. The reason we stress the name is because there's a lot of a lot of us that grew up in town here, and if you give us a name, we can put the name right with the address very quickly. So it's incident, type of incident, address, name, and then the problem, whether it be a seizure, a heart attack, kitchen fire, brush fire, wires down, anything like that. And again, announce that twice. And if more information becomes available, tell it to us on the radio once we radio on the air. When we radio on the air, it's only necessary to acknowledge the units as they radio on by saying message received A2 on the air. After all the units have signed on the air, then you tone it out, you give the location and the type of incident that they're going for. Um, the Zetron, when you tone it out, there's a, there's a tone for medical aid. That tone will be used on all ambulance runs. It will be used on the mutual aid ambulance runs, and it will be used on mutual aid, medical aid, mutual aid accidents. That will be A2's tone, or the ambulance tone, whatever, it's, um, whatever the ambulance is labeled at the time. Accidents, uh, I believe, is labeled engine four. Anytime you get an MVA, that's the tone you hit. Motor vehicle accident, you hit engine four's tone, with the exception of an out-of-town accident. The squad tone is pretty much for everything else. The squad tone will be used for house fires, building fires, master boxes, wires down, everything else that wasn't covered in, the, in engine four's tone as well as A2's tone. That's kind of the catch-all. Um, again, I can't stress enough to make the announcements twice. On medical aids, while we're on the air, any of the additional info that comes available, be sure you let us know. Um, for instance, if we're going there and while we're en route, you find out that it's a domestic issue, make sure you let the, the apparatus know that they're coming into something that the police is going to need to be involved in. Because a lot of times, they'll stay back until the police arrive on scene. Um, if the paramedics are needed, make sure you tell us that the paramedics have been notified and where they're coming from and what unit it is. Hospital status. Make sure you tell the units, again, en route or when they arrive on the scene, rather than having them call and back and ask you. Motor vehicle accidents. Any special info that you receive while we're en route or prior to us responding is extremely helpful. For, incident, for instance, if the car is on fire, uh, rollover, if it's a pedestrian accident, motorcycle accident, uh, truck involved, what type of truck, whether it's a hazmat, um, any type of additional information that you get, whether it's before we respond or while we're on the air, is very helpful. If somebody calls and said no PI, which means personal injury, make sure you let us know who reported that, whether it was a police officer on the scene or whether it's the people involved in the accident. It may be a fender bender and they're in the parking lot swapping papers. If that's what they tell you, let us know. Just don't say on the radio no injuries reported. Uh, if you need to call the office, officer specifically before you tone it out, then do that. Again, the more information you can tell us, the better off we are. Um, if making or receiving a call for an additional ambulance or a rescue, make sure you're specific on what is needed. If another town calls you and asks you, is your rescue available? Ask them if they want a rescue or an ambulance. There are several towns around us that call their ambulance rescues. If they request a rescue, then that would be engine four, because that has the set of jaws on it that we send out of town. If they request an ambulance, then it would be A1 or A2, whatever's in service. So make sure when they call, you make that distinction between a rescue and an ambulance. Also on a MVA, make sure you give the officer in charge the updates. Um, if something becomes a known, known where it's a, a rolled over gasoline tanker and it's leaking or whatever else, make sure the officer in charge knows that. Any updates, again, is, uh, is great, greatly helpful. Medical aids, you can uh, give the updates to A2. Um, 
accidents and anything the officer responds to, you can give the updates to the officer as he's responding. Um, fires. Naturally, it's very important you find out what type of fire. Uh, if somebody calls and says they have a kitchen fire and it's out, make sure you tell us that. Uh, we've had instances where they've had uh, a mattress fire and they said it's out. That wasn't conveyed to us. It's very important that even while we're en route, if they call and say the fire is out or I have a fire in my house and everybody is out of the house, make sure you tell us. Ask them what kind of fire it is, whether it's a chimney fire, electrical fire, brush fire, something like that. Um, dumpster fires. If somebody calls in a dumpster fire from a company, ask them whether it's going to, whether it's a dumpster fire or a compactor fire. There's a big difference. A compactor is usually hooked up to a building. A dumpster is external to the building and not usually part of the building itself. Um, ask them if the building's been evacuated. How was the call received? Was it received by 911 versus cell phone? If somebody is sitting outside of their house, which has happened in the past, saying that their house is on fire, that's usually a good tip that there is a fire, as opposed to them calling from in the house saying they have a small fire. Um, update the officer in charge if other calls are received. In other words, if you get one call before we leave, and on the air you start getting multiple calls for whatever the incident is, just tell us. We're receiving numerous calls on this incident. On a fire, the second piece that will get to the location will be the truck that takes the hydrant. Always give the hydrant locations. Don't wait for us to ask them. Always give the hydrant locations to the second piece of apparatus that's going to be responding to the scene. Acknowledge when the, app when the apparatus have signed on and make sure you listen to make sure they get the proper address. If the first unit signs on and gives the wrong address, correct him immediately. Don't assume we have the right address because we hear it over the PA and what helps us is if you get something like 15 Taplin Ave, say 15. If it's 50, say 50 and make sure all the apparatus gives the right address. In the event of a fire, <clears throat> where the box needs to be struck, let the officer give the orders. So in other words, if the officer pulls up and he says, smoke or fire showing, give him a minute or two to get all of the orders out to the apparatus to get set up before you announce the fire. Let him get situated, then you can announce the fire and do what you have to do on the radio. You can still acknowledge the message. However, just give him a minute or two to sell engine two to lay a line, the ladder truck to the front of the building and things like that. The next thing I'd like to go over with you is some terms. I'll read the terms off um, and then I'll go through them one by one. Lay a line, dress a hydrant, pump a hydrant, fire department connection, fire alarm control panel, um, to name a few. Uh, lay a line, simply that means we lay a hose line from the fire truck, from the hydrant with the fire truck to the fire. It's a hose line. That's all it means is to get a hose line to the fire from the hydrant. To dress a hydrant means just put the proper valves on the hydrant so we can hook the pump up to the hydrant to pump water. Pump the hydrant means rather than just using the street pressure, we actually put the pump on the hydrant to increase the pressure to the fire depending on the distance. Fire alarm control panel, that's pretty much what controls the fire alarm system inside the building. It's an electrical box that when something trips inside the building, it trips the master box outside and notifies us what's going on. Fire department connection is the connection to the sprinkler system inside the building, which we'll pump into and hook into in the case of an internal fire. Master box, plug in, plug out, that just is just a word for enabling the master box and disabling the master box. Plugging it in is in service, plugging it out is out of service. It takes it out of the system so it will not notify us when it's tripped. Zone disable when they call on the phone means they're taking a zone out in the fire alarm panel, so if they're working on it, it will not trip and notify us. Sprinkler systems, wet, dry, CO2, and halon. Wet sprinkler system means it has water in it all the time. Dry system, all it means is there's air in it, and the air bleeds off and feeds water in it, usually in cold, cold and unheated areas. CO2 is a carbon dioxide, and halon is a gas, both used in computer rooms and special hazard areas. Uh, you may hear us say pre-connect pre or Maddie Dale. 
These are the uh, hose lines that are on the trucks that are already pre-connected to the trucks. All we have to do is pull them out, flake them off, flake them out, and they can put water in them right away. PPV is nothing but a big fan that we use. It's, it's a positive, positive pressure ventilator that just blows the smoke out of the building. So all it is is a big fan. Thermal imaging camera is what we use inside the building to detect heat and people that may be trapped in the building. Um, you may hear somebody say, throw the stick to the roof. All that is is the ladder truck. Put the ladder from the ladder truck on the roof. Um, the RIT team, you may hear, send us a RIT team. All that is is a rapid intervention team that stands by outside with their tools, with air and everything else. Should something happen, like the firefighters in, they get trapped, they're the guys that go in and rescue them. Uh, line box, all that means is it's a master box that's on one of the surrounding towns that's on the town line that we respond to. Uh, Woburn may call and say we have line box such and such, this is the address, you announce that and the officer will take care of it. Um, for a motor vehicle accident, some of the terms that you may hear, staging area. If we have something with a multi-casual, um, multi-casualty incident, then we'll need multiple ambulances and we'll put them in a certain area. We'll tell them to stage and we'll give you an exact location and we'll call them as we need them. The jaws of the cutters, all that is is the jaws of life and they also have an attachment on it that are cutters that we use to cut roofs off and posts and things on the doors. Um, airbags, self-explanatory. We use them to raise vehicles uh, off of people or get some height if we have to get underneath the vehicles. Uh, the air chisel, again, self-explanatory. It's a chisel that operates on air that we may need to cut the hood with. A um, few things that you need to know uh, about fires. Make sure you update us en route, en route. The initial report that we give, wait for a minute before you repeat our message if it's a fire. Um, station coverage. Make sure you update the officer on station coverage. If the officer says call in three and one, that means three firefighters and one officer. Make sure you tell the officer in charge that that has been filled once it's been filled. Anything else that goes on in this station while the original incident is going on is to be handled by the officer at the station. Once you get an officer at the station, you get another incident, it's not necessary to notify the officer in charge at the first incident where the fire is. The officer at the station can handle everything else from there on in. Um, orders for us going out of town. Engine 2 right now is our out of town truck. If there's anything additional coming in that the dispatcher wants us to do from the opposite town, make sure you let us know exactly what to do. And a lot of times we will switch over to their frequency and talk to them. But anything additional that you can let us know while we're en route, whether they want us to cover, whether they want us to go the fire, let us know. Um, keeping track of times on the roll call. It's not necessary to sit there and type in the times every time something is said, especially if you get busy. Just do it shorthand on a piece of paper and then you can fill the roll, call, the roll call out later with all the proper times. It's not necessary to bog you down on the computer right away. And uh, this is pretty much all the categories I have to go over right now. Um, I believe we're going to be updating the tape at a future time and add more things into it. Uh, we, in addition, we'll probably be running additional classes um, and I'll, chances are I'll be involved in teaching the classes. So at any point in time, if you have any questions that weren't covered in this tape or that you have questions of, you could talk to your supervisor um, or whatever supervisor is on duty at the station at the time. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant McMahon. And another person I'd like to sincerely thank for his efforts in improving the services of the Wilmington Public Safety Dispatch is Deputy Chief Ed Bradbury. Thank you, Ed. I'd like to thank all of the participants today for helping put together this training video to help give us an overview of the many components of your vitally important job as a dispatcher here in the town of Wilmington. And a reminder that this is only an overview. This just covers the basic skeleton of what it is you have to do. The job of a dispatcher encompasses many, many, many 
functions and many skills in order to be proficient at what you do. So I would like to again uh, welcome you, thank you for participating today, and encourage you to continue to strive to achieve the highest levels of a dispatcher. Thank you very much.